Good morning, everyone. Today is Sunday, February 1st, 1st, 2015. The subject of the lesson is love. Uh, I think today we will start with a new birth. We had a great Bible study yesterday on Daniel and the 91st Psalm, and there's still a lot of more in this lesson. So we'll see. Maybe we'll get back to it. Um, but the new birth, page 15, miscellaneous writing. And I would like, uh, let's see, Elizabeth, would you read the first two paragraphs, please? Yes. Thank you. Okay. St. Paul speaks of the new birth as waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. The great Nazarene prophet said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Nothing aside from the spiritualization, yea, the highest Christianization of thought and desire, can give the true perception of God and divine science that results in health, happiness, and holiness. The new birth is not the work of a moment. It begins with moments and goes on with years. Moments of surrender to God, of childlike trust, and joyful adoption of good, Moments of self-abnegation, self-consecration, heaven-born hope, and spiritual love. Thank you. Okay, the first paragraph. Uh, anyone want to comment on any part of that? What does it mean to you? What is um, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body? St. Paul speaks of that as a new birth, so what would that mean to you? Well, when you redeem something, you're exchanging, like when you redeem a dollar, it's kind of like you're exchanging it for what the value is behind it, you know, the, what it represents, what it really represents. Good. I guess it's kind of like, you know, exchanging what we believe right now to be ourselves for the real, um, you know, the spirit. The spirit. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, and also waiting for the adoption. When you adopt something, you, you bring on something new that you hadn't had before into your experience. So, uh, so good, yes, we are waiting for this uh, and, and actively waiting. Why do you think the, she brought in the, uh, the attitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God? Florence, what do you think on that one? Well, uh, unless we are striving for that purity of thought, we really cannot uh, be see this this new new self, this new true self. Um, it requires, you know, what we've learned that uh, we have that our morals have to be right, our love for God, our trust in God, and walking with Him all the time. It says here is the spirit nothing aside from spiritualization, yea, highest Christianization, and that all involves you know, striving for purity, because the spirit is holy, and you cannot, in some ways, it says you cannot put unholiness on holiness. Yes, Mrs. Eddy says that you can't graft unholiness upon holiness. It's impossible. And yet, and yet you you try. People do try. I know I tried. By and by that I meant mean I would quote things and uh, hope that somehow that was going to be enough. And yet inside I was churning and full of fear or resentment, other things. Um, and that would be grafting the. I think, and I think that's why she says nothing aside from the spiritualization of thought and desire. Because if we try to hang on to our materiality and grow, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. And elsewhere, she says that we, we, we can know no more of ourselves, uh, this is not an exact quote, but we can't know any more of ourselves than we know of God. In other words, only as we strive to know God more and better can we know who we really are. Yeah, and this is why it's so important to get this right conception of what God is. 
because even I know as much science I had as a child, I still didn't really know God, what he truly is, nor did I feel his presence. I was thinking, you know, if you're waiting to adopt something, it means you got this positive expectation of something really good and a receptivity for it. So when, when it shows, you're ready to take it on. And that's quite a wonderful thing. So I think that the idea of being pure in heart, it's very important to keep that heart clean and pure because when this thing comes, if there's something impure, it will fight against it. And you don't want that. You want to be in a receptive waiting for this. Yeah, and I think Are a lot of... Waiting? Go ahead, Go ahead. Tony. Uh, are we waiting for something we don't have? You know, we're waiting for a clearer view of what already exists. We have an understanding of who we are. Who does? Do you? I do. Do you really? Of course. <laughs> you may have that an understanding, sounds, but the... That, that doesn't sound... Why would you say that? <laughs> I mean that. Yeah, why would you say that, Gary? So, so that, that, Gary, of course I know who I am. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you. Florence, were you going to say something? Yeah, I think uh, the understanding, when we get the understanding, now we need to demonstrate it. It needs to be a living thing. I think this is what where it's at as the... Uh, waiting, the waiting is the full realization of it. We do know now who we are, you know, and, and we better know now who we are if we think we, we are living Christian science. I say that because I think for years, <clears throat> when I started to study Christian science, I really didn't appreciate or I didn't understand this, the spiritualization part. So I was still holding on to the material sense of myself, and yet, you know, using the words to to um, <laughs> to, to get better or to um, make situations better, that doesn't work. And I, I've come across uh, many who have been in science for years and still hold on to the material self as the understanding of who they are and strive oh, and still want healing or things like that. I mean, you can't do that. We have to, this is why this uh, uh, this passage or this article on new birth meant so much to me. It, it really brought the, the fact that until, unless I understand that I am not material and working for the full realization of it, I'm not really doing too much. Thank you. Yeah, and, and can we ever know everything that there is to know about God? Well, I mean, that's no. eternity, work of eternity. Right, it's and, the work of eternity. Yeah, and that's why, you know, it's, it's a journey. And the more we know about God, the more we know about ourselves. And, and it's something to look forward to. And you can tell how much you know by what, you, what you're able to, to live and to demonstrate. And, in, and unless you do that, you don't really know. So, and this work, it is individual, but it is also collective. It, it helps when you're working out your own problems. Believe me, you're helping everyone else too, because you are spiritualizing and purifying an atmosphere. And it sends out something wonderful. And we work here too in our church to to really work to keep the purity as best we can. None of us are perfect. <laughs> We're perfect in God, yes, but we are working out our salvation. But we do, we do strive as best we can to keep the purity of Mrs. Eddy's science in everything that we do, whether it's this, the round table, the lessons, the watches, all that we do. So... And that's why I was poking fun at you, Tony. <laughs> yeah, I was just joshing. So, um, let's see, the next paragraph. 
The new birth is not the work of a moment. It begins with moments and goes on with years. So, and then the first, moments of surrender to God. What is that about? How do you surrender to God? Let's see. Luann. Oh, I knew you were going to call on me. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, I, I think that like, you get little moments actually when you're you're in prayer or you're thinking about God or even going through the lessons themselves where you where something kind of an understanding comes into your mind that you just really can accept that you really know and I think is that you have those little glimpses once in a while I, I think that there's, there's moments and then you, you totally can give your life over to God in those moments but uh, you know if you don't do it all the time and you kind of wander away from it so it turns into little little glimpses of, of God in daily life Thank you. Thank you, Luann. Um, let's see, who else? Surrender. How do you surrender to God, Linda? Um, I think it's giving up my sense of will um, when I push a lot. I feel like it's a child sometimes who's just willfully going around and doesn't want to give up and then just wears himself out. <laughs> And then you, and then you realize you're you you moved away from God. Yeah, thank you. That's a a good example. You just give it all. Finally, you just said, "I, I Father, I can't do this. I, I I'm just not happening. Not capable. And we are not capable. Only God is capable. So it, it's a surrendering. And it can be. It is moment by moment. Yes. And it can be surrendering, you know, your child, your job. Linda said your will. Thy will be done. Right. Yeah, and that's like every day, all the time, isn't it? We face, we're facing things that need to be done or think we need to be done. And it's, Father, not my will, but thine be done. So think about that moment by moment. We're going to think about all these things, moment it's by moment. Sometimes. Go ahead. It's me sometimes, Any? too. It's, it's yielding to an idea. You know, I was working on something earlier this week, and um, the thought came to me that I was fearing a particular situation, and I was working with that idea that God has not given me this. Oops, we lost you, Lenny. Oh. That was my fault. We got sorry, Lenny. Lenny. Sorry, Lenny. Could you repeat that for, right. for a minute? Yeah. No, I was going to say, for me, sometimes it's it's yielding or surrendering to, you know, an idea or or, or a, a, I guess, a, a thought from God. I, I had said I was working on something earlier this week where I realized I was fearing a particular situation. And so I worked with the idea of God not giving me the spirit of fear. And what did that really mean? And... It's hard to explain, but I did kind of feel like this yielding in my thought where it just, I guess it started to click more than it had before. And that felt kind of like a surrender to me because I surrendered to the truth of that idea and I felt like it made more of an impact in my thought and in my experience. Good. That's good. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, when you surrender to the truth, that's a very important point. You say, I, I'm gonna, I, I accept this to be true. Maybe you don't feel it. Maybe you do feel like you're being fearful, but, but it's saying God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You have to surrender yourself to that point. You have to give of yourself and accept it to be true, even though you don't feel it. And if you do that, that's obedience. You're, you're obeying a, a law, a principle of God, a biblical principle. And when you do that, then things begin to happen. Now, now I, and I can remember struggling, or I would say this a lot, this golden text has meant a lot to me, but I, I wasn't surrendering myself to it. So, good point. Give yourself to this truth. Accept it as true. 
even if at first perhaps you don't believe it, accept it. Go by faith, not by sight. And you will find it leading you out of the dark. And, and another important point that Lenny said was she recognized she was fearful. You've got to recognize it. You've got to see what's driving you. Some people don't recognize it. They just push here, there, let fear run them, and they don't know. Slow down enough to, to understand that you're, being, you're, you're dreading something that's coming in the future. So look at it. What are you so afraid of? Face it. Challenge it. Don't let it shove you around. Recognize it's there, and then look it squarely in the face and say, if God be for me, who can be against me? And then go forward. I think this is why it should be, um, uh, you know, the understanding to welcome every challenge is so important because it felt to me like as I overcame one, um, un one challenge, say it was finances, and I gave it all to God, and that was resolved. Then something came about my, maybe my home, and then that had to be given up. And that surrendering, um, it re I really, looking back, I appreciate it so much now. It was, it was intense and very difficult, but I see now how I'm, I was pushed up to surrender all these things gradually to God. And it makes a big difference. Thank you. Okay, what about childlike trust? Um, how about Wendy? <coughs> um, it's, uh, it's interesting. I was watching a video this morning, actually, that I shared out that showed a little girl and you could see in her that childlike trust and it's so pure and um, it, you, it's just you just see it and just to have that to surrender to that and and to go back to that type of trust is, is so important it is and as, as we know Jesus said you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven exactly uh-huh Unless, unless you become the child. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and what does Mrs. Eddy say about, you know, joy, joy to leave the false landmark, uh, ready to, to take this new way of, of thinking on? And just as a little child holds its father or mother's hand and, and trusts that, so we must hold our father's hand so to speak, and trust him. And it says in this week's lesson in Isaiah that God, God does hold our hand, and he, not to be dismayed, not to dread, not to fear, because he will be with you. And he will contend against those things that contend against you. And it could be um, anything, financial situation. It could be, you know, some person. More likely, it could just be your own negative, fearful thinking. But God will help you with that. He's with you. Think about it. Realize it. Feel his presence. Anybody else? Okay. Um, joyful adoption of good. How about you, Fairly? On the joyful adoption of good? Right. Well, the joy that I have found in finally be beginning the new birth since I came here, the joy is one of the chief qualities I've found that overcame depression by my understanding and knowing that God is with me all the time that I'm always holding his hand it's such a joyful adoption of good 
Thank you. And as, as you've heard from Carolee's testimony, she did come out from mm -hmm. a very deep depression in which she was being medically treated for. So, <clears throat> does anyone know what the first watching point is? Tony, do you know what it is? <laughs> oh, he stepped out for a second. Oh, Isn't it did? learning to watch? Learn how to watch? No. In, in the 500 watching. Oh, in the 500. Yeah. The first watching point. It's one to know, and it's, it's and I think it's significant, it's the first one. It's, it's you can't do anything unless you have your joy. If you don't have your joy, you, you get it back, you work at it. Um, he, he likens it to if you'd fallen into a, a, a frozen pond or something, <clears throat> and you start swimming, you, you make things worse. You have to pop up and out. And so it is with joy. So is, is joy dependent on your outward circumstances? No. 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 It comes from your relationship with God. Yes. It so. makes everything okay, really. If you come to know God, you know you're taken care of. Yeah, and, and really, it, to me, it's trusting that God is good. And since God is all, good is all. And that's a power. And that's why anything that comes to us to try to depress us or make us unhappy is unreal, because it's not of God. So if you, if you are at night feeling depressed and discouraged about your circumstances, you understand that your joy comes from God, not your circumstances. And you work to get your joy. But it, Jesus said, your joy no man taketh from you. We're all without excuse to be miserable and depressed. Not, not if we're claiming to be a scientist. Um, you claim that joy, it's yours comes to you directly from God, as do all the other qualities. But you have to claim it, and sometimes you have to work for it. It doesn't just happen. Same thing in the morning. You claim your joy. You keep your joy. And it's not this superficial, uh, everything's wonderful, God is great. It's a deep, deep joy, uh, an understanding of who and what God is, an appreciation of him. One thing that's been very helpful to me is a passage from one of our hymns where it says, Faith can sing through days of sorrow. All must be well. And, uh, and I was given that to work with a from practitioner years and years ago, and I realized that, yeah, if I'm complaining through my days, if I have days of sorrow and then complain through them, I'm being unfaithful. Faith can sing through days of sorrow. In that way, break this mesmerism of sorrow and uh, find that all is indeed well. Yeah, and we certainly have had many examples in the Bible of, of just that, that the joy and the gratitude and the praise for God broke the mesmerism, because whatever it is, it is a mesmerism that's holding you down, depressing you. And the joy will lift you out of it. And the joyful adoption of it is, is just isn't this wonderful, joyful adop adoption of good? Isn't this science wonderful? I do want to adopt it. I want to make it my own. I want to bring it into to my experience and make it my own, and I'm, I'm happy to do it. I'm not drudging around doing it. When you're adopting it, too, you realize it didn't come from you. Just like you, know, you adopt a child, you didn't, you didn't birth that child. It didn't originate in you. You're adopting it because it comes from God. Good point. Right. Good point. Thank you and you're making it your own. Yeah. Okay, moments of self-abnegation. What is abnegation? Self-denial. Yes, self-denial. And, you know, it'd be easy to have a 
not not to think of it. Don't think of it as you're some in some you know monastery beating yourself. Um, but it's an important point to understand. So anyone want to moments of self abnegation? Taking the time to read and pray and listen to God. Yes. Anybody else? Let's see. Elizabeth? Um, well, you're, de you're denying whatever is not coming from God. You have to do that at every single moment. Any thought yes. that is, you know, trying to mesmerize you, you just have to, you have to work on that and deny it. Yes. All the self-thought. The self-thought. Think about them. Self-justification. Why, why you have a, an excuse for being miserable or being nasty or whatever. Self-righteousness. I'm so great. Nobody else is. What are some others? Self-love. Self-love, right. Self-love, and what's that all about? It's all about me. Me, me, me. Yes. The world revolves around me. Everything is, you know, how, how things affect me. It's all about me. What I want, what I'm going to get. What about self-pity? That's pretty extreme. It's like inside your head is going this demand that everybody give you attention and cater to your own specifications. It's pretty, pretty extreme selfishness. Yeah, and it's feel it's feeling sorry for yourself. Like you're a victim. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're a victim. Look what's happened to me. I'm so miserable. I can't do anything about it. You have a pity party, or even worse, you start blaming God for your troubles, which really puts you in a hole, and also shows you don't understand who and what God is, which is why it's so important to know that. It's your human personality. Yes, very much so. Personal sense. Yes, that's true. Personal sense would gather all these self qualities up into one big basket. All of which have to be surrendered to God. Well, I've always felt it so admirable when somebody can say, you know, nobody's ever done anything to me. I'm going to take responsibility for my own thoughts, actions, and circumstances and rise from here, so help me God. If somebody gets to that point there, i got the most respect for somebody who's going to take responsibility and rely on God. Welcome there. And then there's also what Linda had talked about, self-will. You have to get rid of that. Your way or the highway. You know, and even, even if you strongly think you're right, you know, just pause. You listen to what someone else has to say or, or think more deeply about it. Because very often when you strongly think you're right, maybe you need to back off and reassess. Make sure this is God and not your will. The other thing that I... Go ahead, Florence. No, it's you? all right. <laughs> Who was Linda? Oh, Linda, go ahead, Linda. No, I was, I was just going to go on what you said, that we already know that if it's God's will, there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. <laughs> so you don't have to force it. Right. Yeah, and that's why it's such a liberating thing to get rid of this self. Yeah, it's it's the most damning of all things, and and it is it is personal sense. It's all about you. It's a selfhood apart from God. And that's why Mrs. Eddy has hammered on it so much. Personality and personal sense. It's what sin, disease, and death attach themselves to. The self but apart from God. 
And if you're aware of it, and then you can get rid of it and not have it. It's a purification process. And the old man put off and the new man put on. The other thing that I, I believe goes with this self-abnegate, self-abnegation is um, it's, it's denial of all the things, self, all the things you might want. Your, your I want list. And I wrote on, on the forum, but that's why I love this so much in, in the responsive reading. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Let that be your one desire, instead of all the other things you want. If you're looking for companionship or health or uh, all kinds of healing, supply, all the I want things, let this be your one desire, the one thing you want more than all else. And if you do, as Christ Jesus said, first seek ye the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You don't do it for that reason but it will happen. And what's interesting about that is when it does happen and all these things get added unto you, they don't mean the same as they once did. They truly are byproducts. All that matters is, is <laughs> seeking after God, dwelling in his house, beholding his beauty, inquiring in his temple. That's all really that matters. Everything else is byproducts. You're grateful for it, but um, it's not like, oh my gosh, can't live without it can't live without God. That's, that's what you can't live without. Anybody else? Um, another aspect of self-abnegation for me has been putting into practice what I'm learning, um, sharing it with others. So like getting up out of that prayer chair and living it. Thank you. It's hugely important. And it, it, must, it has to be done. And if you're really using this science, it will be done. You can't help but share it with others. You just, you can't. You have to be muzzled and chained down. <laughs> it just comes out of you. Thank you, Sana. I've got a few others that have joined. So. Um, okay. Then the self-consecration. It's similar, but a little different. Maybe, Lenny, you speak to it, or, or Elizabeth, because this is why I was so thrilled with the readings Wednesday night, because in a way, that's what it was about, about not scattering your fire. Yeah, I mean, you do have to have something of a laser focus, because if, you, if you're just kind of blindly shooting everywhere, you're not, you're not hitting anything, you're not, and you're not making any progress. So there has to be there has to be a bit of a laser focus to your you know, to, to what you're striving for. Isn't self-consecration aligning your thought with God? You're consecrating yourself to Him? Yes. Right. Yeah, Mrs. Eddy says the human self must be evangelized. We need to bring our life as close to God as we can. I looked up the word consecration in the 1828, and it's defined as devoting and dedicating a person or thing to the service and worship of God. And in the in the lesson this week, it said Daniel served his God continually. It takes it takes this. It takes consecration. It takes dedication. As we talked yesterday about making that covenant. You can't just say I'll do it when I feel like it. Sorry. I mean, you can do that, but you will suffer the, the consequences of doing that. It takes some commitment. It's not something that you just do when, you, when it fit, is convenient or, you know, when it suits you. Not to really... You, you couldn't possibly do it if you find out what a good God you have. Your consecration will be to Him. You couldn't do otherwise. So, it's a very important point, and it was brought out 
very well in the readings Wednesday. So thank you for that. Anybody else on that? <clears throat> okay, Heaven Born Hope. Where else could our hope be? It could be Earthborn. <laughs> and where does that get to? It usually is, right? Yeah, it usually is Earthborn. So uh, <laughs> that's the problem. Usually riding on some sort of thing. outcome or yeah. thing or, you know, person. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to ask yourself, what do you hope for? Hmm. Expecting good. Yes. That's the heaven-born hope. Your expectation coming from the Lord. So, yeah, a good point. What what are you hoping for? Are you just hoping for some material thing to work out, so to speak? By that I mean godless, no God in it. Let your hope be heavenward. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Evans used to like to tell this story. She called this woman <clears throat> who would come and see her occasionally. Dear old Mrs. I hope, <laughs> because she was always saying, I hope, I hope, I hope. And <laughs> it's almost a little bit like I'm trying, I'm trying. You know, you're hoping, you're hoping, but nothing would ever happen. So don't don't be that either. Don't be a dear old Mrs. I hope, but uh, have some knowing. And if you, and if you're hoping is heaven born hope. You will have the fruition if your expectation comes from the Lord. And then the last, spiritual love. What it, what is that? What's the, how does that compare to what's the other type of love? Human love. Human love. Yeah, what's the difference? Human love is um, there's usually um, strength attached to it, and it um, you don't do what I say or uh, do, then you can instead of love them, you hate them. Their spiritual love is is godly love, and it's, it's unchangeable. Thank you. I think uh, human love loves the personality. Uh, spiritual love sees the godlike qualities and loves that and knows that that's what man is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that's why it can never be anything other than love. One is so limited and the other is, is infinite. Yeah, yeah. So think about that. Test test yourself. What is your love? Is it here today and gone tomorrow? When you say you love someone, do you love them when they're being nice to you and then you, suddenly you hate them when they said something like a little kid, I hate you, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Eddy said an indication is, you know, do you love other children as much as you love your own if you have children? That's a big question. You, you, if you're if you're expressing divine love, you should. Your love just will come welling out of you. The other is a personal sense. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever my and and I I certainly grew up in that a clannish sense of love. Had to be put off and purified. Well, mothers competing for their children. Definitely human love, and it fails miserably. Any of that, or or the pride, so pr pr proud of your child's achievement, pushing them to do better or get into certain schools, or all of that is human love, and it will turn to hate. And and you're so ashamed of them if they've done something not up to snuff. You're so ashamed. You may not want to admit that, but that's what's going on. And it doesn't bless. 
down. And, and we're talking about children, but it's true of any relationship, a friend or a, or a spouse, a spouse, anybody. So keep, keep it on that divine level and, and check yourself that you keep it there and ask yourself, how much do you love? Are you feeling a, a great sense of love for all mankind? You know, that's what Mrs. Eddy did. That's why Carpenter would say it's at night when she would sit on her porch swing at Pleasant View, praying for the world, that there was a, such a sweetness in her that it brought, would bring him almost to tears. If you have that kind of love for mankind, you, you can't not do a watch or miss a watch or not be part of, a, of it or... Certainly your individual watch will have tremendous meaning to you. You can't do otherwise. That's being the image of love, which you are, in truth. So if you're not feeling that way, if you're feeling pretty selfish, well, just check yourself. Watch it. But there again, it is important, too, that you do love yourself and take time for yourself. You're not a doormat either, so it's the right balance of it all. Okay, any questions or any anything more to that paragraph? Well, I just wanted to make one more little comment about Heaven Born Hope. I, I happen to know of two individuals right now who are going through real uh, severity, emotional severity, um, and... Uh, it's interesting because they're both feeling so miserable, so awful, and yet they've both made it really clear that they're not interested in hearing about God. And I'm thinking, without that, what is your hope, really? You know, that that's what heaven-born hope is, because humanly, these people seem to feel they have no hope. and. It's true. You can't offer hope on a human level. Things can seem really dark, and that's why they're dark. <laughs> and yet they don't see it, and they refuse to go there, and so they suffer. And I, I love that term, heaven-born hope, because for me that was the beginning of light coming into my life. So I just found that interesting. Yes, thank you. And you can just pray to know that, that the dear ones will awaken and want to have this heaven-born hope because it's true. Otherwise, it's pretty hopeless. The Adam dream is just terrible. No one in their right mind wants to linger in it. Some people just don't know better. So, what, yep. what, we, will, what we will find, as, as your light shines, God, God will bring to you those who are ready. And, and he has, and Sana has attractive people and her stepdaughter recently just joined our church so you know you just you just keep doing the best you can and letting your light shine and and people are attracted people change people come they feel it and it's it's i guess it goes back to the beginning it's not really that anything has changed it's just our viewpoint is changing we're seeing things correctly and bringing out that right manifestation of all things hey mary Yes, sir. I'm, I'm glad you said that because, you know, hearing that story of the two people who won't turn to God, it's, it's, you know, I was asking myself, well, what's our responsibility? You know, something like that comes, you know, into your experience. Um, obviously, it's not your res personal responsibility to make them find God, but you do have a responsibility <laughs> in your you do have a responsibility within yourself to understand what's happening in that situation. And only God can lead you to understand what's really happening. But if you walk away and don't find, you know, the piece of the truth of what's really happening with that person, you're left with a real negative feeling that God is not present, that God is not all powerful, and He is. And um, when those really aggressive suggestions come, it's, um, it's paramount that you don't get uh, beat up by that. that that's a, that'll take away your joy. 
you know, so I'm so glad you, you said that because we, we do have a responsibility not to leave it in such a negative state, you know, because we do, you do love these people. You know, you want nothing more for their eyes to open. It's wonderful. It, it is. Thank you. And that's absolutely right. And Mrs. Eddy, I, I believe it's in Collectania, but she says never leave anything in the negative. Never. That includes the news reports. That includes just this example. You always bring it back to God. That right there, right where that, that negative picture seems to be, is the presence and power of God because that's all that there is. And in knowing that, you will bring it to pass. You can't help but because it's the truth and it's not really you doing it. It's God working. God in operation. <clears throat> so, okay. Um, the, the paragraph that begins with time may commence because this kind of goes along with what we're saying. And t Tony, you read it. Okay. Time may commence, but it cannot complete the new birth. Eternity does this, for progress is the law of infinity. Only through the sore travail of mortal mind shall soul and sense be satisfied, and man awake in his likeness. What a faith-lighted thought is this, that mortals can lay off the old man until man is found to be the image of the infinite good that we name God and the fullness of the stature of man in Christ appears. Thank you. And, and this is it. This is what we're talking about. And this is what Sana, whoever they were friends, that you, you have to suffer through it to come out and put off that old, old man. You have to get so you're so sick of this. You're so sick of this Adam dream. You've just had it. And then you're ready. You're receptive but on the new man to, to awake in his likeness. What's travail? It's like tough labor. Yeah. Labor with pain. Labor with pain. And I'm sure we all can say we've all had it. We've all had it. And it's not very nice when you're going through it. <laughs> Pretty. But the outcome is tremendous. If, if, as in Jacob, you struggle with it and come come out the victor of it. So, yeah, and a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the requirement. Uh, one of the requirements is a broken spirit, and if our spirit, our spirit has to be broken <laughs> eventually. But that's the human sense; the human will has to be broken, and and, and when that happens, then then we're ready. Yeah, we've gotten rid of all that self. I mean, I won't say all because it's a, we're always getting rid of self. But we've got a, gotten rid of a, a big part of it. We, we recognize that we're ready to give it all up. All those self qualities we've thought of, we've just mentioned. We've had it, that personal sense of things that just leads you to despair. Okay. And I this. find it encouraging because she says eternity does this. So this is something that it's going to happen every every day. It's not like you finally put off all of the old man and you're there. <laughs> Tomorrow there will be more work to do. Yes. Heidi? Heidi, did you want to say something? Oh, you can hear me. I didn't know. Um, a while back, I don't know, I was thinking about uh, being hurt, the feeling of being hurt all the time or somebody hurting me. And I think it was pointed out to me, I think you did, Mary, that that was pride. And that kind of jarred me. I never really thought of it that way before. Yeah, if, you're, if your feelings are hurt, that is your pride. And uh, better to see that and get rid of it. And it wraps into here because it's just, it keeps you in a certain state of mind, of willfulness and wanting to force you away, maybe on. Yes. Don't Thank you. Else. So anyone else want to say anything about that last, that paragraph Tony just read? I think we will 
stop here. I'm going to read something short. Uh, I read it yesterday in the Bible study, but I think it's so wonderful um, about praying and how Mrs. Eddy prayed three times a day, as did Daniel. Saw the importance of it. And then I would like, let's see, um, Lanny, I want you to end and reading the 91st Psalm. So as I'm reading this, you pull up your 91st Psalm. We're going to end on that, the whole entire 91st Psalm. But first, this is miscellaneous writing, page 133. Mrs. Eddy, three times a day I retire to seek the divine blessing on the sick and sorrowing with my face toward Jerusalem of love and truth in silent prayer to the Father which seeth in secret and with childlike confidence that he will reward openly. In the midst of depressing care and labor, I turn constantly to divine love for guidance and find rest. Okay, Lenny. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their, in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Thank you. That is the truth. Now we will work now to know that this service will just blow the roof off. Bless all mankind with its power and strength and comfort. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.